I was a graduate student at Stanford, and I still remember to this day seeing an ad that NASA had put into the Stanford student newspaper, and it was the first time that they were admitting women into the astronaut corps. I ripped it out of the newspaper, and I literally applied that afternoon. NASA picked 35 of us to be the first class of astronauts specifically selected for the space shuttle program. If I'm given a, a job or an assignment, I feel like I need to do the best job I can, and part of that is, is probably uh, just, just pride. I have a lot of pride in what I do. You feel that the coverage that has been given has been disproportionate with regards to the uh, first American woman in space. I think that it's maybe too bad that our society isn't further along. It's time that we get away from that, and it's time that people realize that women in this country can do any job that they want to do. When I first got there, you really didn't see women in leadership, and that's really changed during the time I've been at NASA. Eileen Collins, the first woman to command the space shuttle. Peggy Whitson, commander of the International Space Station, and the NASA astronaut who has the most time in space of any astronaut. As an 11-year-old, I want to be number one player in the world, and you think, what does that look like? I got to see Althea Gibson in person. Well, I saw what it looked like. It changed my life. The teenager in that bedroom is every one of you. Her bedroom is our laboratory for the future. We have to make a change. We have to make it better. This is our legacy. Before coming to UCSC, I was a huge space geek, and I had known about Sally Ride for a very long time. She inspired countless girls to do something and reach for the unimaginable. When I was a little girl, I always dreamed of flying in space. Amazingly enough, that dream came true for me. Now it's up to all of us to ensure that this generation of students has access to a high quality education so that the boys and the girls can build the foundation that will enable them to reach for the stars and achieve their dreams too. Good evening, and welcome to the second annual Women in Leadership Conversation at UC San Diego. I'm Pradeep Khosla, Chancellor of this amazing and great campus. Thank you. Not for me, for the campus. And I'm truly honored to have all of you here tonight, uh, with us tonight. Last year, the US Postal Service issued a stamp honoring Dr. Sally Wright the first American woman to fly into space. They chose Sally because she inspired the nation as a pioneering astronaut, brilliant physicist, and dedicated educator. And we are fortunate and proud that Sally Wright was a professor of physics here at UC San Diego for nearly two decades. Her legacy lives on here in many different ways, not just in the way she touched many lives, but also in the ways she motivated minds, she created educational programs and the book she wrote, but also through the US Navy research vessel named in her honor that Scripps Institution of Oceanography operates and the Sally Ride Graduate Fellowship here at UC San Diego. Tonight, our celebration of Dr. Wright continues with this, our second annual Women in Leadership Conversation. Sally's life partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy, Tam, where is she? She's right here somewhere, there she is. Tam O'Shaughnessy created this event to reflect what Sally Wright really cared about, science, research, education, and equality. So thank you, Tam, for all you do for UC San Diego, and especially for co-founding and leading Sally Wright Science at UC San Diego. Please give her a big hand.
So your vision, Tim, as executive director is not only leading our university's efforts, but also influencing efforts around the country to find and develop tomorrow's great scientists, researchers, and problem solvers. So thank you very much. Tonight's Women in Leadership conversation brings, amazing, uh, brings together amazing trailblazers who have shattered barriers and paved the way for women across the globe. Through a candid and a very timely discussion, our distinguished panel will share their personal stories and visions on how women can help lead our nation to a better future. And moderated by the award-winning broadcaster and one of my favorite broadcasters and author, Lynn Schur, Tonight's panel includes Sylvia Acevedo, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Girl Scouts of America. Please give her a big hand. <laughs> Chelsea Clinton, Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation. Please welcome her. <laughs> and Dr. Jedida Eisler, Assistant Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College. Please welcome her. So I'm sure after you've heard these amazing people on stage and listened to their inspiring stories, uh, you'll be willing and ready to make a change that will impact lives for the better. UC San Diego is committed to providing education and research opportunities to all bright young minds from all backgrounds. And we are proud to continue Sally Wright's legacy. And like Sally, we are very enthusiastic about looking deeper at the world around us to collaborate and solve societal challenges. And now it's my great honor to bring to the stage a colleague of mine, our Executive Vice Chancellor, Dr. Elizabeth Simmons. Thanks very much, Chancellor Kosla. I'm really delighted to be here with everybody for this now annual event to honor a personal hero of mine and a former member of my own department here at UC San Diego. Sally Ride. Decades after Sally Ride came to prominence as an astronaut, physicist, and leader, we still unfortunately find that women, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and members of the LGBTQ community all remain underrepresented or relatively invisible within STEM fields, and especially within STEM leadership positions. And the causes of these situations are related and the impacts are mutually reinforcing. So if society tells you from a very young age, and even more so once you hit middle school, that you are not expected to excel in STEM fields, and if you see few representations of women scientists in the media or at the head of the classroom, how likely is it that you would develop a dream of becoming a scientist? How would you build the persistence needed to master mathematical and technical topics? How would you develop the ability to debate and discuss and experiment with scientific ideas? And if society at the same time tells you that the attributes of a leader, vision, decisiveness, assertiveness, are not appropriate to your gender, and if you see few women leaders across all areas of society and fewer still within STEM, how likely is it that you would develop the self-confidence and the skills necessary to lead? Now you can see the self-reinforcement in action. If you have not become a scientist in the first place, how would you ever have a chance to be a leader within STEM? And if we have no leaders, no visible women or minorities in STEM, how would the next generation of young people feel welcomed to even enter those fields? And then you can see the problems that this creates for STEM disciplines and for the many aspects of our society that depend on science and technology. If the wasted talent, you can see the wasted talent, the lost perspectives, and the undiscovered knowledge that hampers pro pro progress in scientific disciplines. And the thwarting of the very meritocratic and objective ideals that STEM claims to follow. So how do we change the equation? How do we get past this? Well, we need to make accomplished women and members of other underrepresented groups in STEM visible to students and to one another. So the fact that Sally Ride was a revered professor of physics here at UC San Diego is still making a difference to her successors here on campus. 
We have to include women's achievements in the scientific narrative. So it's crucial that we keep Sally Ride's story and her legacy visible for generations to come. And we have to actively seek out and identify at a very early age future scientists and leaders and support them. Let them know that we see their potential. Ask them what journey they want to follow and help them figure out how to achieve the goals they're setting for themselves. And help them explore science and leadership through richly engaging experiences, challenging experiences, alongside peers whom they identify with and can get to know. And this is exactly, of course, what Sally Ride Science is doing for the next generation of scientists and leaders. But it all starts here with exactly what we are doing today, gathering to acknowledge that these challenges are real and have an impact and have to be surmounted, and listening to a diverse group of women leaders, like our distinguished panelists, who are creating a new vision of what women can accomplish. So I think that this annual event is a truly amazing and appropriate legacy for Sally Ride. Now I would like to welcome to the podium one of my favorite and most influential colleagues, Vice, uh, Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, Becky Pettit. Good evening. This event is so important to me, especially as Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Very touching to see the crowd that's here today. According to the Center for American Progress, women make up a majority of the US population. Yet even though we hold 52% of all professional level jobs, American women lag substantially behind men when it comes to representation in leadership positions. Events like tonight's Women in Leadership Conversation will help by bringing together leaders from diverse backgrounds who share a passion for inspiring girls and women to strive and to persevere. On our campus, there is a powerful movement underway, a movement that advances inclusion and ensures that UC San Diego benefits from the contributions and talents of women and others who have been historically excluded from positions of influence. Over the past five years, our university has seen significant advances in diversifying our leadership. Today, four of the nine academic divisions are led by women. In addition, women faculty lead in the generation of research dollars. That should have gotten a round of applause. <laughs> Worth repeating, women faculty lead in the generation of research dollars. And our latter rank faculty from underrepresented groups has grown over 30% since 2012. While we celebrate our progress, we also recognize how much further UC San Diego can go in our efforts to attract and retain a more diverse community of scholars. To this end, my office has led the development of a strategic plan for inclusive excellence that represents an unwavering commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion across campus, and that holds campus leaders accountable for achieving our shared goals. We know we still have much work ahead of us, but I am inspired by the momentum and our steady progress toward a more inclusive UC San Diego. And now it is my privilege to bring to the podium Dr. Tam O'Shaughnessy. Thank you, Becky. Always does a brilliant job. <laughs> so you've heard, uh, I'm Tam O'Shaughnessy, uh, one of the uh, five original co-founders of Sally Ride Science, which is now uh, Sally Ride Science here at UC San Diego. Um, and also, I'm very proud to say that I was Sally Ride's life partner. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of Sally's favorite quotes was by the late physicist and great science communicator, Carl Sagan. Sally used it as a rallying cry. Here's what Carl said. 
We live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology, in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. <laughs> he was funny. But that's why we started Sally Ride Science back in 2001. Um, and after Sally retired from NASA, she was a physics professor here. And today, as you've heard, UC San Diego carries on her enormous legacy, um, not only through Sally Ride Science, which is uh, based at UC San Diego Extension, uh, but also um, in the physics department, as Elizabeth noted, and just sort of her, uh, her presence on campus. Becky mentioned the other three founders. I just want to say their names again because the five of us were sort of uh, neophytes. We didn't know much about business. We didn't really know what we were doing when we started uh, the company. It was a company until we came here at UC San Diego. But we had a passion for trying to encourage and educate and inspire young people, boys and girls, to stick with science so that they become scientifically and technologically literate, and that uh, is so important today, as, as Carl mentioned, um, and so that they at least consider careers in STEM. Um, and also, uh, you know, Sally was smart enough, and all of us uh, uh, agreed that being scientifically and technologically illiterate is important for all students who come from all backgrounds, all walks of life. Anyway, the other uh, co-founders of Sally Ride Science are Karen Flammer, who is uh, here on campus at UC San Diego, head of uh, our professional development for teachers, Alan Lopes, and uh, Terry McEntee. <laughs> Once we moved uh, here on campus in 2015, then UCSD uh, Extension, under the guidance of Mary Walshock and Ed Abeda, have just done a, a fantastic job uh, taking what we created, but uh, building and uh, uh, creating new innovative programs like our Summer Junior Academy, our uh, free STEM, STEAM workshops for students, at library branches across San Diego County, our professional development uh, for teachers, how to teach uh, science, engineering, math, and also how to inspire boys and girls to stick with science as they go through school and to uh, consider careers. Um, and now our annual Women in Leadership event uh, conversation is uh, you know, something that we're very proud of. and. Uh, it's an important conversation for communities across our country, indeed around the world, to have. Um, Women in Leadership celebrates Sally's life by reflecting on the things that she cared about most. Uh, Sally was an athlete, a physicist, a space pioneer, a science writer, and also a passionate advocate for excellent and equitable education for all students. And in each of these areas, she was a leader. For this year's program, I sought out panelists who could offer insight on what it takes for women to become leaders, the barriers that they face, and the mindset that allows them to succeed. Tonight's panelists and moderator are leaders from diverse backgrounds who will share valuable perspectives on how we can inspire girls to become leaders and I see the Girl Scouts back there, so I'm talking to you. <laughs> and empower women to help lead our nation to a better uh, future. So tonight, we celebrate women in leadership as we continue uh, working to keep Sally's dream alive. Thank you. And now, it's my uh, great honor to introduce Lynn Scher. Good evening, and welcome to the Girl Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and welcome to the only current event celebrating an American dynamic leader who is not running for president. <laughs> Heaven knows, and by the way, I am sure that Sally Ride is somewhere up there among the stars, shaking her head at the disarray down here. But she was invited any number of times to toss her space helmet into the political cosmos. There was an editorial cartoon in 1984, and that's the year after Sally first flew, and that cartoon just captured the fervor. Uh, there were a crush of candidates that year, including astronaut turned Senator John Glenn, and they were all crowding the field during the Democratic primary, 1984. And in the cartoon, there's a TV anchor man, and he is shown announcing the results of a new straw poll. And he reels off the name of then popular politicians, most of whom you've probably never heard of at this point. Anyway, the caption reads, he's saying, Cranston, Hollings, Mondale, Hart, Glenn, Askew. And then he says, they were all stunned by Sally Ride, who captured 89% of the vote. <laughs> she was not a candidate. Eight years, later, eight years later, when a third party presidential candidate named Ross Perot was looking for a vice presidential partner to run with him, a bemused colleague left a phone message slip, remember them, phone message slips, uh, on Sally's desk here in La Jolla. Here's what the uh, phone message slip said. A reporter just called, he wrote breathlessly. A reporter just called asking about the rumor that Ross Perot had asked you to be his running mate. Exclamation point, exclamation point, question mark, question mark. <laughs> he knew his colleague. Sally even turned down NASA a number of times. When one exasperated manager finally called her up and said, Sally, what would it take to get you to accept the job as NASA's administrator? Sally responded with her signature wit. Oh, she said, if they'd move it to California. <laughs> Ever see the view from Sally's old office? Yeah, overlooking the Pacific. Now, don't get me wrong. While Sally would never give over her life to the scrutiny of public office or the ponderous ways of Washington, she never refused to contribute her brain power to the institutions and the causes that she championed. Her grueling work on the commissions investigating the Challenger and Columbia accidents, hideous events that took the lives of her friends and tarnished the reputation of the agency she loved. Her work on those commissions was critical, leading to a better understanding of the causes and more importantly, ways to fix them. Her later work on the Augustine Committee, formerly the Review of US Human Spaceflight Plans Committee, helped shape American space policy and a plan worked out with the US Congress. Earth first, that was always her priority, let's, let's get the home planet in good shape. And then long range goals, Mars, Moon, Asteroid. That was 2009, sound familiar? Sally never shied away from the consequences of her historic flights. There always has to be a first, she said knowingly, and once that happens, society changes. Our world changed when Sally Ride flew because yet another barrier to full equality was finally shattered. Because little girls and little boys understood that if an accomplished young scientist with a passion for everything from postage stamps to tennis could break that ultimate glass ceiling, then they too could do anything. But it changed even more when she took up the mantle of leadership occasioned by her celebrity. As co-founder and CEO of Sally Ride Science, she created this company that would awaken young female minds to the wonder of science that had captivated her, to inspire and ensure the next generation of America's mathematicians and engineers and physicists and, yes, astronauts. She wanted them to see, as she had, beyond stereotypes. And she could do it because she'd been there, because she'd cared, and because she could make a difference. That, I would suggest, is what makes a leader. And I want to just take a very brief moment to thank Tam for creating this event to honor this extraordinary part of Sally's life, which was she knew how to be a leader and she desperately wanted to share it. That's what this evening is about. It's sharing it with all of you. So thanks to Tam for that.
What made Sally a great leader was that she also did it with humor and humility and the astounding ability to make it all so much fun. On the eve of her historic first flight, when she was briefly the most famous person in the world, her face was on every magazine cover, she was on TV shows all over the place, Sally was, of course, off limits to the news media. This is the night before she's about to fly. For one thing, she didn't want to do any more interviews. Uh, more to the point, she was quarantined, as all astronauts were, to prevent any stray germs from compromising the launch. But Sally always enjoyed, shall we say, stretching the rules to accommodate her very independent soul. As the ABC News correspondent covering the extraordinary event, I was in our workspace at the Cape, finishing up my script for that evening's news. At one point, I heard the phone ring, someone answered it, and then they said, Lynn, it's for you. I picked up the phone. Hi there, came her cheery, familiar voice. What are you doing in five minutes? <laughs> Sally was my friend. We had bonded during my coverage of the shuttle program, and we frequently shared beers and shrimp and gossip over the years. So I stopped typing and I got into the game. I don't know, Sally, I replied. What am I doing five minutes from now? <laughs> well, she said, why don't you walk outside your trailer? We were, our, our workspaces were trailers. This is the glamorous world of television news, by the way. <laughs> walk outside your trailer, turn the corner, and then look down towards the parking lot. I put down the phone, I stepped outside into the fading Florida sun, proceeding to where she directed me, and there she stood, about 25 yards away, wearing shorts and a t-shirt, waving at me from a car parked right off the main drive. I wasn't allowed to get closer, and she knew I wouldn't. I wasn't going to jeopardize the flight. But it was reassuring to see her in such good spirits. I could report exclusively on the air that night that the woman most in demand at the Kennedy Space Center was doing just fine and pushing the envelope as she always did with her playful anti-authoritarian attitude. <laughs> I know, of course, where she got it. Joyce Ride, Sally's mom, who could not be here this evening, was asked back in 1978, when Sally was first named, how she felt about her daughter's selection into the first class of astronauts to include women. Well, with Sally going into space and her sister Bear studying to be a minister, Joyce Ride was totally practical. Well, she said, one of the two of them is going to get to heaven. 